I just finished taking my Titleist Performance Institute Level 1 certification. So basically what this means, and I will discuss this a little bit more later, but it means that I can do a movement screen with you. Um, and that is just going to look at specific, specific movements required in your golf swing. And then based on your performance on that, we come up with an exercise program um, to help improve any areas that need it. So this is a two-part prize. So you'll win the initial assessment and then you'll win a follow-up 30-minute um, visit where we can go through your exercise program together. And um, because I'm a physiotherapist, you are lucky that we get to adapt that to your, your needs or if you have any injuries as well. So everyone here today will get a chance to win and we will draw that at the end of the webinar. Um, so let's go ahead and test out our chat feature. Remember that it's in the lower right hand corner and just type win in the chat box if you are interested in the prize. You will get entered either way, but we just want to make sure everyone can use the chat feature. Okay, continuing on. Okay, like I said, the winner is going to be announced at the end of the workshop. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to give you guys a little summary of what we're going to be covering tonight. So initially, we're going to go through some fun facts about golf. Then we're going to talk about some common golf injuries. Then we're going to go through why a warm-up is important. And then I've put together a little PDF um, warm-up routine for you guys. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but you'll all get it at the end of the webinar. We'll email it out in the next couple of days, and it will be available on our website. So um, if you guys need it, you can definitely reach out to us and we will email it to you if you don't get it in the next few days through email, okay? And then we'll talk about um, the information around my Titleist Performance Institute certification and what I can offer um, to you, okay? It should be about an hour long tonight. It might be a little bit less, but that's what we're kind of aiming for, okay? All right, so we are going to launch our first poll and test it out. So I have a question for you guys. What, what year do you think golf was invented? And I'll get, give everyone a minute to answer that. So golf was invented in 1457, apparently. They don't exactly know, so we're not 100% confident in this date but that's what most theories suggest. So it was created in the Middle Ages. And interestingly, um, women's golf didn't actually start for another 300 years. So we didn't start until about 1811. So some of you were pretty close there on your guesses. Okay, and then I have another poll for you. So um, if the poll doesn't work, just write it in the chat again. But if um, we'll launch it and then try out this little... Uh, activities button if you can find that on your screen so have you ever gotten a hole in one so the chance of getting a hole in one is about one in twelve thousand five hundred. again if you google it it may be slightly different but that's what i was able to find online um and that is for amateur golfers so professionals they have a better chance it's more around like the one in 2500 uh, again, I'm not sure if that's entirely correct, but nonetheless, it's not that common. So the fact that out of 20 of 20 of us, three have had all in one, that's pretty good. Um, okay, and then Tiger Woods made his first hole in one at eight years old. So that's interesting because that's pretty young. And then I'm not sure if any of you guys watched the Masters, but at the pre-tournament um, par three, a golfer named Seamus Powers got back-to-back -back hole in ones. So I have no idea what the chances of that would be, but I bet it's not that likely and probably won't happen again for a pretty long time. So I thought that was kind of cool. I was making my presentation when that happened. So I was like, oh, I'll add that in. <laughs> okay. And then um, golf was the only sport played on the moon. And apparently the, the best shot was about 200 yards. Um, which makes sense because of um, the differences in gravity and air resistance on moon compared to on earth, um, considering he's wearing all that gear. <laughs> okay, and then we have Phil Mickelson, which some of you may be a fan of. He actually shoots left, but he is right-handed. 
So there's a picture of him shooting left and then signing right. And he actually also had a pretty good master's performance. He tied for second this year, which was pretty impressive. Okay, just a couple more fun facts and then we'll get into the, the other stuff. <laughs> Okay, so the average 18 hole golf course is 6.5 kilometers long. So when you're walking it, you're gonna cover about eight kilometers and that's 10,000 steps. So that's a good stat to know, especially if you're recovering from an injury and you prefer to walk the golf course. So um, you can make it a goal to be able to walk eight kilometers while hitting your club around. So I like that one as a physio, but. Okay. Okay, so we've covered the fun facts about golf. Now we'll get into a little bit more of the educational stuff. So I'll try and keep it somewhat interesting for you and then we will continue on. Okay, we have a little question before we get started. What do you think is the most common area of the body injured in golf? The most common one is the low back. Okay, so studies have found that after a round of golf, up to 28% of people will report low back pain. And this is also true for professional golfers. Um, it's a little bit lower with 23% of them reporting back pain. So it's definitely common. And then we have um, the shoulder. So shoulder injuries make up about 20% of golf related injuries. And then we have the wrist and elbow. So when I was trying to figure out what was ranked one, two, three, it was lower back. And then it was kind of a mix between wrist, elbow, hand as number two, and then shoulder as number three. Um, but different sites were saying different things. But the most common injury with the wrist and elbow is um, tendon injury. So we will talk about that because I'm sure you've all heard about golfer's elbow. So we'll cover that a little bit tonight. Okay. And then before I get into why our injuries happen, I wanted to just talk about compensation because I'm going to be saying that a lot and referring to it a lot over the next few slides. So a lot of the time when our body is feeling good, but then one day we wake up um, and an injury just kind of sneaks up on us for no obvious reason, often it's going to be coming from our body compensating. So compensation is an improper movement pattern that places stress um, more than normal on parts of our body okay so i'm going to talk about the low back shoulder and elbow next and discuss how some compensation patterns can come over time okay so we'll start with the low back and why it can become injured so muscles work in partnership with each other so they can influence how each other act and function so tightness can cause weakness so for example, if you have tightness in your hip flexors, which are at the front of your hips, your glutes can become weak. So we want to not only stretch tight muscles, but we want to strengthen the opposing muscles on the opposite side of our body, okay? And then number two, we have stability versus mobility. So different muscles have different jobs. Some muscles, um, their job is to, to provide us with more stability while other muscles provide us with more movement. So if a muscle that usually provides movement becomes weak, then the other muscles around it that normally provide us with nice stability can become to try can start to try and help out with movement. So it comes at the cost of us losing some stability. So for example, if our glutes are weak, our low back muscles that normally are supposed to be providing our core support, they may try and help out and then that can lead to a lower um, back injury, okay? Okay, and then the last point with the low back is um, I just wanna point out something on this slide. So the blue sections are joints that are more stable and the red are joints um, that are more mobile. So from a structural point of view, our low back is stable. So we want it to provide stability while we get more movement from our um, mid-back and our hip. So if our mid-back and our hips are tight and limited, then we're going to increase movement through our low back. So similar to what I talked about in the last point, but ultimately it's gonna lead to compensation. Okay, so some of the injuries 
um, that can happen in our low back are going to be to our muscles, ligaments, um, joints, and, or discs, okay, and or. Okay, so now on to the shoulder. So the shoulder is an extremely mobile joint. So the shoulder socket itself is not very deep. So if you imagine the hip, it's got a nice socket that has a lot of contact. The shoulder sits more like a golf ball on a tee. So structurally, it's not very stable, um, but that's what allows us to have so much movement at, at our shoulder joint, right? So the stability from our shoulder has to come from our surrounding muscles, which are gonna be the muscles of our shoulder blade and then our rotator cuff, which I'm sure everyone has talked about or heard about. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and my smiley faces will line up now. <laughs> So the rotator cuff is actually made up of four muscles. So independently, they each do different movements of our arm. So they will lift our arm up and rotate it both directions. But together, they work as a suction cup to keep our shoulder nice and stable in that joint. Okay, so the four muscles there, I'll just point out, you have your supraspinatus, this guy on top, and this is looking at the shoulder from the back our infraspinatus, our teres minor, and then there's another one called subscapularis. You can't see it in the picture. It sits in between your shoulder blade and your rib cage and comes around and attaches onto the front. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so shoulder injuries in golf are often caused by similar mechanisms as we discussed for the low back. So we, sh we know the shoulder is very mobile, which is a good thing but with the shoulder we want controlled mobility and this control comes from the surrounding muscles like i talked about so for example when we get when we want to get into the end ranges of our backswing which takes our trailing arm if you're a right hitter into external rotation we need to have um, a lot of strength in our rotator cuff and shoulder blade muscles so in the next slide i'm going to show you a picture of me because i um, need to work on my shoulder strength. So I'll kind of explain that to you. So if you look at the picture on the left here, um, you can see that when I'm standing upright, my shoulder is able to get to about 90 degrees. And that's almost in line with my trunk, which is the yellow line. Ideally, you want to actually be able to go further than this, but um, I can't, but some of you might be able to. And then the picture on the right, I'm just standing in like a, an iron posture. And when I stand in this posture, I'm not able to get anywhere close to 90. Um, so what this tells me is that when I'm when my body is slightly forward in that golfing position, my, I don't have the control to get my shoulder to those end ranges. And that's because I need to work on strengthening my rotator cuff and my shoulder blade muscles. So. I need to do this and that will help with controlling my backswing and hopefully prevent injuries. So I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Yes. And then for common injuries that can happen with golf to the shoulder, rotator cuff, the AC joint, and that is this guy over here and it connects your collarbone to your shoulder blade. Okay. And then you can also just get like pain and dysfunction when uh, your shoulder is not functioning in its optimal state. So if some muscles are weak and not doing their jobs, then we can get pain because the movement of our shoulder is, is altered. Okay. Okay. Now on to the elbow. So when we talk about tendons, muscles actually turn into tendons and then tendons are what attach onto the bone so tendonitis tendinosis tendinopathy all big words but they are often used interchangeably and tendinopathy is kind of the general umbrella term for all of them okay so what happens with tendinopathy is that the tendon gets irritated and the composition of the tendon actually changes so normally our tendons fibers are nice and aligned like this, but when um, tendinopathy occurs to them, they get kind of haphazard and their orientation goes from being nice and aligned to kind of crazy. 
and this can cause pain, okay? So you can get tendinopathy on either side of your elbow, and depending on what side, it's gonna be named either a tennis elbow or a golfer's elbow, okay? So golfer's elbow more likely affects the inside, and then tennis is the outside. So tendinopathy can occur um, due to repetitive overuse, and this overuse likely comes from repetitive movements that occur due to compensation. So not repetitive movements that are um, happening in the way that they should be, but ones that are happening in the way that we might be compensating a little bit. Um, it can also happen if there's significant tightness in the muscles. So with our elbow, a, a reason why it's such a common um, area for tendinopathy, tendinitis, uh, is because all of a bunch of your muscles in your forearm all come together and form a common tendon, which then attaches above your elbow. So there's multiple muscles um, that go into one tendon. So if they're all tight, they're going to be pulling on that tendon, pulling on the bone, and then irritating it. Okay. So the best thing that we can do to avoid injury is to create optimal movement patterns to limit compensation. So we want to continue to strengthen, increase our mobility, improve our movement patterning, all of which we kind of have discussed. Okay? And then the second component to prevention is just to try and help our bodies with recovery. So making sure we're having good nutrition, hydration, massage, physio, stretching, sleep, all of that good stuff. So why a warm-up is important. So in almost every other sport you do, a traditional warm-up, but in golf there seems to be a bit of a stigma around it. You don't really see anyone warming up at the golf course, right? Just a couple little twists and that's it, and they're off. So before hockey, soccer, basketball, you run a few laps, shoot a few balls, shoot a few pucks, you move around and do some stretches, so golf should be the same, right? So, um, warming up before warming up is important to prevent injury and for improving your game. So, studies have shown that a short in a short warm up, as little as five minutes, can increase your driver's carrying distance and club head speed. So, this means further drives. Um, some people in the study were actually able to gain forty five yards with their driver after a warm-up, so see if, why not, right? <laughs> yeah, I agree, Pat, <laughs> with that. Okay, and then what do we want our warm-up to look like? So firstly, we don't wanna do a static warm-up. So a static warm-up involves static stretching, which has been found to actually decrease power output. So static stretching is when you perform a stretch and you hold it for a longer period of time. So you're holding it for like 15 to 30 seconds or more, okay? So we want to stretch statically, it's good for us, but just not before we go out and play a round of golf. So we want to do a dynamic warm up instead. So dynamic stretching involves stretching the muscles while we activate them. So this means that we're trying to activate the muscles we're going to be using um, for our golf swing in a way that gives us more mobility and better strength. So a, a dynamic warm-up helps our brain communicate with our muscles more effectively. So imagine that it's like adding insulation to an electrical wire. Okay? So we want to improve mobility through our hips and our mid-back. Um, which is what I talked about earlier, right? So that our low back doesn't try and help out. And then we wanna have good activation of our glutes and our core. Okay, and then for my advice for a warm up, just keep it short. Um, it can be as short as five minutes, right? But even if it's less than that, it's still going to be better than nothing. Keep it convenient and keep it consistent. So, like I said, I do have a document for you to download, or I think we will email it to you, but you can also download it on our website after. Um, we will send it to you, Chris says, okay? Uh, so, you can pick and choose the ones that work best for you, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go. Okay, so we're done. Why a warm-up is important. Okay. 
So this is what you you guys will get through your email. That's the first page. Um, I'm going to demo an exercise now. So if you guys want to pin me, then you can. So you want to, again, um, hover over my video and find the little thumb thumbtack push thing and then click on that and it'll make me bigger for a second. I'll let you guys play with that. Um, I'll just talk a little more and then we'll demo the exercise, okay? So one point I wanted to mention was that this warm-up document is fairly general. So if you're having trouble with any of the movements or if they are painful, please don't continue doing them. They're not going to be for everyone, especially if you have other injuries going on, we might wanna adapt them, okay? So if you have other injuries or you don't feel comfortable or confident doing them, then don't push through. You can reach out to a healthcare professional. You can come see one of the physios here and we can help you out, okay? Okay. So this is the little, one of the, the fifth exercise in that pamphlet that you guys will get. Um, I just want to demo it because it maybe is a little confusing. So let me just set myself up here. And you guys can try it with me. I can see some of you. So um, what you guys want to do, first of all, is you're going to put your hands behind your head. Okay. And then I want you to rotate as far as you can in one direction. And then when you feel like you can't rotate anymore, I'm going to turn my body. I want you to side bend. So you're kind of tilting your elbow down towards the floor. And then take a deep breath while you're here. And then come back up and then try and rotate again. And you should be able to go quite a bit farther. So rotate, side bend, deep breath, come up, rotate more. So I like that one because you can see it immediately and feel it. Hopefully that worked for you guys so that I can see. Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, good, thanks Pat. Okay. So, um, like I said, you're gonna get those warm up exercises, but the rest of them are fairly easy and there's just some pictures of me. So if, if you have questions, just reach out and email me if they're um, quick and easy with the exercise document. Okay, and then for um, my Titleist Performance Institute assessment. So this is the um, course that I just took. So I just completed my level one. So basically it allows me, like I talked about a bit earlier today, um, it allows me to do a movement screen. So it looks at the individual movements that are utilized all together um, for, in an optimal golf swing. Okay, so it determines the areas of your body and the movement mechanics. So how, how you're able to move your body, um, where we can make some improvements through exercise, okay? Um, and then it's nice because um, the fact that I'm also a physiotherapist is you can book um, Titleist Performance Institute assessments with me and you can bill on your benefits because we can also look at some physio related stuff if you have injuries. So that's kind of a nice component, but yeah, especially if you do have an injury and you're wondering, okay, well, I'm trying to get further rotation, but we can figure out, okay, is it possible for your body or is it not? And then kind of go from there as well. Okay. And then the second part, which um, I also talked about a little bit earlier is once we do that screen, um, we generate an exercise program that is specific to you. And then um, I will probably add some of the ones that I prefer in there as well, if we want. But you have the option of a 15, 20, 45, 60, or nine, 90 minute exercise program. So however, however hard you wanna go with your um, golf exercise routine this season, we got it for you. Okay, and then, as I'm talking about that, I just wanted to kind of um, send home that there's not one perfect swing and we don't want to fix your swing. Everyone is different, so every swing is different. The purpose of the golf assessment and the specific movement patterns is to determine um, areas that we can improve or areas that, okay, no, we, your body cannot do that for whatever reason, and that's okay. So it's not about changing how you hit a club 
or a swing club or hit a ball. And um, it's actually interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Masters again, but John Rahm, who won, he is trained by some of the Titleist Performance Institute trainers. And everyone talks about his swing and says, oh, he's, he's got a weird backswing. It's not enough. He must be stiff in his um, like trunk, so his mid-back. But it's actually because he had club foot as a kid. So his one of his ankles is very stiff. So that's why he can't get back into his back swing. So everything's pretty related, which is cool, but also sometimes frustrating. Okay. Okay. Well, that is the end. So, okay. Warm ups different for different sports. Um, like the movements that you would do for. Thanks, mom. <laughs> um, the movements that you would do for different sports uh, would be different, right? But the the same idea applies, like especially for sports where you're doing more power output, you would you prefer to do it dynamic. So, um, growing up, I did soccer and figure skating, and we always did like dynamic warm ups because if you statically stretch, the research just shows that you can lose power output. So it's not gonna like. Statically stretching isn't necessarily going to be bad for you. It just makes your power output less. So if you're doing a sport that requires a lot of power, then you want to um, do dynamic stretching instead. Hopefully that answers your question. And thank you, Pat. I see some names that are familiar. So hello to everyone that I know from here. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay, so where do we go from here? So I know I covered a lot today, but I hope it was helpful and enjoyable. Um, I find that golf is such a big part of our community and I've been treating quite a few golfers and I enjoy golf myself. So I know how important it is for you all to have a full and pain free season. So physiotherapy can be a great way to manage any injuries, but also we can use physio as a prevention tool, which um, I think is kind of a new a new trend because a lot of the times people only come to physio when you're hurting right but we can do stuff before you hurt so that's helpful and yeah okay um so if you are wondering if physio would be appropriate type you can type golf in the chat and then we will write your name down and uh organize a 15 minute phone co phone consult with you if you would like if you've heard enough today and you know that you want to try physio, you can call or book online with me for a physio specific golf assessment or any of our other physiotherapists um, at Sterling or 26th Street. Um, me and Rob um, both do the golf assessments. The other physios are great if you have any other injuries, but if you're wanting that movement screen, then book back now. But yeah, if you guys have anything else that you want to ask, then let us know and thanks so much everyone i appreciate you guys suffering through the beginning there <laughs> and i guess sally d will reach out to you or yep. yeah we'll reach out to you and we'll let you mention please treat me yeah yeah okay okay good night everyone have a good night Enjoy the sunshine.